Hello and welcome to this evening's UCSF virtual performance and discussion of My Stroke of Luck with UCSF resident and clinical fellow alum, Dr. Diane Barnes. Thank you for tuning in and being part of this program. My name is Katie Maloney and I'm the Senior Director of Alumni Relations. Before we start today's program, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items to help with your experience. To submit a question at any time, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please be sure to keep your questions brief, and given the size of the audience and the number of questions, our speakers may not be able to answer everything, but we hope to offer an interesting conversation and answer many questions about Dr. Barnes' performance and about stroke prevention and recovery. Our program tonight will start with a short 20-minute performance by Dr. Barnes, followed by a conversation to answer your questions with Dr. Barnes, Dr. Wade Smith, and Dr. Kathra Halabi. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Diane Barnes. Diane is an actor, writer, and speaker, speaker, a Bay Area transplant born and raised in New York City. During her career as a diagnostic radiologist, she suffered the stroke that inspired this story. Although she returned to work, the magic in the practice of medicine was gone. Dr. Barnes then stumbled into improvisation and the world of performance. With David Ford, the SF Bay Area Dean of Solo Performance at the Marsh Theater, she developed My Stroke of Luck, chronicling her stroke and reinvention. Dr. Barnes is a Meisner trained actor and completed the Global Identities Workshop with Anna Devere Smith. She is a graduate of Stanford University and Yale University School of Medicine. She conducted her postdoc training at UCSF and Stanford. Her new show and development is called Not One of Us and centers on the intersection of race, class, gender, and privilege in her life. Dr. Barnes' performance will include one brief scene change when she will turn off her video and then return. Thank you for joining us tonight as we present excerpts from My Stroke of Luck. It's Saturday, July 2nd, 2005. I'm off for the holiday weekend, no beeper, and not a chance of being called back to the hospital. My boys, now 12 and 14, have gone to see War of the Worlds, so tonight, I'm flying solo. The evening is glorious. The sky painted orange and red as the sun nestles into the horizon. Mosquito hawks swirl in the bright fluorescent lights of Novato Horseman's Arena. And tonight, for the very first time, I'll be competing on my own horse, Dr. Z. He's mine, all mine. We start in a gentle lope. He spots the herd and the way he tosses his head and neck. He is one cow pony happy to be back at work. I've spent the last three months getting to know Dr. Z and now we're a team with me, the head honcho, which is pretty amazing. This 1500 pound tank of muscle a huge prey animal, the largest size of any land mammal on either side of his head, primed to flee from danger, has accepted me as his leader, a myopic apex predator who smells like the meat I eat. I look right, Z takes me right. I look left, we veer left. Little squeeze of my thighs, we pick up speed, lean back, whoa, and we stop on the proverbial dime. And then we're loping again, all muscle and readiness. Tonight is my night. We're going to win this one. Suddenly, Z slows to a walk. Hey, up, boy, come on, pick it up. He turns right. Hey, hey, crosses the arena and stops in front of Jimmy, our veterinarian. Hey, Dan, you're supposed to be warming up. Is there a problem? I, I don't know. Yeah, yes, Z seems to have a mind of his own. I dismount. Oh, I have the worst headache 
of my life. Surely only a lightning bolt could feel like this. But the starry night sky is clear. I know, and Zinu sensed before I had a clue. A Diane, you okay? Jimmy, standing beside the horse trailer. How'd I get from the arena over here? I don't remember moving. Z, snorting in my ear. Wiggly, ropey things in my hands. No, Diane, you're a doctor. You can't be a patient. Just pull yourself together. This will pass. Let me tie him up for you. No, Diane, escape now. No, Jimmy, I, I don't need help. Jimmy takes the squiggles from my hands, ties Z to the trailer. Oh, rains. How did I not know that? Diane, you're right. Eyes, kind. Gentle, brown. No, Diane. Escape now. He'll call an ambulance and send you to the hospital. Don't let him know. No, Jimmy, no. I, I just need, I'm okay. I just need to lie down. The next thing I remember, I'm lying down in my car in the parking lot. Searing, white hot lightning. Oh, my boys, at the movies, I need to get, no, Diane, don't let anyone know and don't let them take you away. But you can't die here away from your boys. You better get home. I lie there a long time. How long, I have no idea. I'm afraid to blink afraid to move. Diane, we're shutting it down now. You sure I can't call you an ambulance? No, Jimmy, thank you. I'm fine. Well, I wish I let someone call an ambulance or that someone there could read my mind and know that with a brain injury, my thinking was already seriously impaired. But I'm a doctor and no one there was going to say anything once I said, I'm fine. How many people had come into my hospital complaining of the worst headache of their lives. How many CT scans had I read? Like this one, diagnosing devastating strokes. Now this is an axial slice through the brain, so angle like this. This big white blob is blood, hemorrhage, hemorrhagic stroke, or hemorrhagic infarct. Infarct meaning dead tissue. That much blood in the brain, that tissue is dead. This black ring and fingers is edema or brain swelling. And yes, this is bad, but that's my job. I'm a radiologist. I look at images to find bad things. And no, this one isn't mine or I probably wouldn't be standing here in front of you. How many of these patients had I followed in the ICU, comatose until their deaths, or until transferred to a nursing home 
in a permanent vegetative state. You see, I knew that at my age, with zero risk factors, my stroke was likely from a ruptured aneurysm. Now, an aneurysm is a balloon-like outpouching of a blood vessel. And the moment it bursts, a piece of brain turns to current jelly pudding, kind of like this. It's gone. My chance of surviving the first 24 hours Fifty-fifty, And if I survived, my chance of living without significant long-term disability, one in three. So death was looking like a pretty attractive option. And I confess, in those days, I was not a glass half full kind of gal. I drive home, take eight 400 milligram Motrin, the strongest thing I had in the house, and go to sleep. And as I do, I know I'm choosing to have my children find me dead in bed in the morning. Now, it might spook them. They might not ever want to live in the house again. But isn't that better than coming home to an empty house, worrying all night? Your mother disappeared into the bowels of the hospital system in an ICU on life support where children are not allowed. Or if I don't make it and a squad car pulls up and police knock on the door to give them the news or invite them for a ride in that squad car to identify me in a drawer in the coroner's office with a toe tag. Pretty black and white, grim thinking, absolutely. But if you're a single parent, you love your children more than life, you're sure you're going to die, and your brain isn't working, well, shh, spoiler alert, I don't die. You're familiar with the saying, doctors make lousy patients and a physician who treats him or herself has a fool for a patient. Ta-da, exhibit one. But there are reasons. Those of us in the allied health professions have seen more than we'd like about being patients. We've seen suffering. We've caused suffering in our attempts to heal. We've seen death and we've seen or been party to dubious invasive attempts to cheat death. We have definite choices about how we want to live and die and only wish the rest of you did as well. More than two thirds of us have advanced healthcare directives or living wills. Do you? Statistics tell me that more than 60% of you do not. And if you're of color, 84% do not. So say you have a sudden severe brain injury. You no longer recognize your loved ones. You won't get better. A ventilator is keeping you alive. Is that what you want? Who would know and who will speak for you when you no longer can?
where am I? It's not the hospital, but I know this place. Is it home? But the walls, the colors, paintings, everything's off like a messed up rainbow. Am I dreaming? No. Oh, the shaggy gray and white face is in mine. Big black nose, big pink tongue. Oh, it licked me. Dog, dog, my dog, Nooper? No. Nooper was my first dog in college. This is a Nooper. Shaggy dog pictures flash like a flip book. The page stops. I'm standing in front of the Christmas tree between my two sisters. I can't be older than five. I'm crying. My younger sister, Bonnie, is holding a big shaggy gray and white stuffed dog. She's beaming. Then we're at dinner. Mother holding court from her usual position at the head of the table. <laughs> well, <laughs> Diane kept bothering me about a fool dog. <laughs> she wanted a dog, had to have a dog, couldn't live without a dog. <laughs> Well, I decided to fix her. Mm -hmm. Under the tree, Christmas morning, a big shaggy dog. <laughs> well, Diane came running, arms open. Oh, you should have been there. When she saw it was stuffed, I picked it up at FAO Schwartz. She let out a wail and burst into tears. <laughs> why we'll never have a dog in this household. As, all, as if all God's creatures don't make BMs somewhere, but growing up in Manhattan, middle class and black or Negro as we were then called, there were so many rules and expectations in our family, all to keep us on the safe side of respectability. Barkley! Oh, this dog is Barkley! <laughs> Bark. Barkley. I, I've had lots of dogs since Nooper. They've all been shaggy, gray and white. To heal that five-year-old broken heart with a real shaggy dog? How many more of my choices have been from seeds of a long forgotten past? Thank you, Dr. Barnes, for your performance. I know our audience will have lots of questions for you and also for our other guests, fellow UCSF alumni, Dr. Wade Smith and Dr. Kathra Halabi. Let me introduce them now. Dr. Smith is chief of the UCSF Neurovascular Service. 
He's earned his medical degree and doctorate in neurophysiology from the University of Washington and trained as a resident in neurology and fellowship in critical care at UCSF. He leads the team of stroke neurologists and neurointensivists in our 29 bed neurological intensive care unit at UCSF. His research is on the treatment of large vessel stroke using catheters to remove the clot from the brain's um, blood vessels and has led to a worldwide change in stroke treatment. He is a founder and now president of the Neurocritical Care Society. Dr. Halabi is a neurologist who diagnoses and treats patients hospitalized with neurovascular emergencies, such as ischemic stroke and subarachnoid hemorrhage. She earned her medical degree at UCSF, where she also completed her neurology residency and her neurovascular fellowship. She founded and served as director of UCSF Neuro Recovery Clinic, which provides care for patients recovering from acquired neuro neurological injuries, including stroke, concussion, and other types of traumatic brain injury. Dr. Halabi's research focuses on investigating neurological injuries with the goal of developing new treatments. If you have questions, please submit them in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen, and we will try to answer as many as we can. Welcome, Dr. Smith and Dr. Halabi, and thank you again to Dr. Barnes for sharing your story through your performance. My first question is for Dr. Smith and Dr. Halabi. What moments from Dr. Barnes' performance stood out to you as familiar in other patient experiences? Maybe I'll <clears throat> take her first uh, uh, response to that. I think one thing that she does, I mean, an incredible actor, um, is play the inner dialogue that patients have when they're having a stroke. They try to negotiate their way out of it. Now, it could be that she's headstrong physician, you know, never complain kind of thing, but they're, I'm amazed, and I, I think Dr. Halabi can point this out too in her own experiences, patients minimize their symptoms when they happen. I mean, you would think that if you looked at your hand your right hand and you couldn't move it, you couldn't lift it off the, the bed or you couldn't use your mouse, you know, on your computer, that you would immediately say, oh my gosh, there's something wrong with me. I need help. And that's not the response. The first response is, oh, I don't know, maybe I'm tired or that's not really happening or you know, I'm not going to tell anybody about that. It'll go away. It'll get better. And yet <clears throat> those precious few moments where you're having those symptoms are critical for your recovery uh, because the treatments that we give are incredibly time sensitive. So it's challenging. I mean, we can't talk to Dr. Barnes and say, hey, if you ever get a really sudden severe bad headache, you know, don't, don't sleep it off, you know, don't die. We can, we can help you. Um, uh, but it's phenomenal how that denial um, comes in play, into play. Yeah, I would echo that. And, and what strikes me is the contrast between that initial uh, denial or, you know, almost nihilism to the resilience over the years beyond your ability to share your experience and get the public service announcement out there that these conditions are time sensitive and treatable. And, and here you are today sharing that message. I think that's the most striking thing to me about this. Great. Well, um, thank you, Dr. Barnes. And I see a question that's just coming in that I think would be good to kind of tell a little bit more of your story is, how did you finally end up in the hospital? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is do as I say, not as I did. Um, the next day, um, I drove my son to camp about 130 miles, which was probably the most insane thing I've done in my life. But I and I turned around, drove back and went to my hospital, the hospital where I worked. I walked into the CT scan. I was the head of CT. I walked into the CT scanner and I said, I need a CT scan. And the tech looked at me and I got my CT. And then I walked to the ER. She said, don't go out, you need a gurney. And I got up and walked to the, to the ER. And within about two minutes, I was on a gurney and out to our neurointensive care facility. So, um, 
but that is not a that is a cautionary tale, not a good idea. No aspect of it was a good idea. If but yeah, it was ridiculous. But that's how I got to the hospital. <laughs> Well, and I know in the performance, you discuss some of your symptoms. Um, perhaps the three of you could maybe talk about what are some other symptoms that, you know, people should be aware of when, you know, to, to kind of recognize a stroke. I would say that um, anytime you have a brand new headache that comes on suddenly, or it's the worst headache you've ever had in your life, that's a red flag. Um, anytime you have a really sudden onset symptom like trouble speaking, trouble seeing, trouble moving an arm or a leg, obviously those are red flags too. Um, and uh, do not uh, pause, call 911. Um, don't drive yourself anywhere. Don't have family members drive you anywhere. There are systems of care in place uh, so that the first responders will take you to exactly where you need to go to get the treatment that you need. But it's really the, the sudden onset nature of these symptoms that's the, the red flag of interest. So, and I, you know, let me add something. I had a friend who had was at a party and she's a very gregarious extrovert. And um, she said people kept walking away from her. So she went home and um, her son said, mom, what are you doing home? You just left. And she said, everybody kept walking away from me. And, and they were disappearing when I talked. Well, she had lost her visual field. And so she couldn't see people anymore. And she went and had her son, thank goodness, called an ambulance and um, she was having a stroke. Um, We've and, had patients with a similar uh, field cut like that where um, half the world's missing. And if it's a left half um, and you drive a car, um, they get into head on collisions because there aren't any cars over there. They just go around something. Um, and if it's a right-sided visual loss, they can hit people in a crosswalk. And it's amazing, just like we were talking about, and um, Dr. Barnes really demonstrated well, again, is this lack of appreciation of a deficit. So, um, you know, if you're, you would think, again, if you can't see to one side, you would say there's something wrong with my vision, and that's not it at all. You actually take that as the new normal. Um, and uh, I, I think... The brain's capacity to recognize loss uh, requires functions of the brain to be there that that no you know you have two sides of your body and um, the one thing I think we could we could express a little bit more detailed is Dr. Halabi talked about stroke symptoms but one that's really difficult for people to recognize is aphasia where you can't speak um, now you've all had an opportunity where you couldn't think of a word to say or a person's name and that's some well, it's certainly a new normal for me, um, but the persistent inability to, to say a word, to, to look at an object and say, that's a hand, um, this is a, an earphone, and be able to name things quickly and easily. If that persists for minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, that's a concern. And your initial response is gonna be, oh no, I'm just tired or something. Um, then what you can do is you can look to see if your hands are weak. And so I talked about, you know, you can, if you can't move one side of your body and you're really thinking about it, you're going to call for help. But for those of you who might have a little bit more concern about this, thinking maybe one side of my body is weak, one side of my body is not, do what we do as neurologists. <clears throat> Hold your hands out in front of you, put them flat like you're carrying a pizza box, close your eyes for the count of five, and then open your eyes and see if your hands are still there. If your hand falls away, so if I close my eyes and one hand drops down, I open my eyes and I notice, oh my gosh, one hand's down, that's a problem. And so you can use the inverse, which is that if my hands are there when I open my eyes, it is highly unlikely I'm having a stroke. And actually it's about an 85% probability that if your hands are still there, you're, being, you're okay. So two sides of the coin is one, we don't wanna make people really frightened that any symptom that they might have is signature of a stroke. Um, uh, the, it's usually the other way around where you don't notice the problem or don't pay attention to it. So there's one acronym, FAST, which is FACE. When you smile and you talk, are your face screwed up? Basically look in the mirror and see if one side of your face moves and the other side does not. Half of your face is weak, that's abnormal. Um, 
uh, your arm strength, like we were just testing, can you hold your hands up and make them flat like that and they stay there? Arm, F-A, face, arm. S is speech, can I speak normally? Or my words all slurred, like I've had too much to drink. That's a dysarthria. Can I not think of the words to say? Can I not follow instructions? Um, that's a speech problem as well. And then the T of F-A-S-T is time, meaning that we want to intervene quickly because we have treatments that we can talk about as, as time goes on, but those treatments are incredibly time sensitive. And I'll just add that if you have a constellation of symptoms like the ones that Dr. Smith described, or even if they go away after a period of minutes or you know uh, less than an hour, that's also an emergency. Um, so that's basically a transient ischemic attack or mini stroke. It depends on uh, what where you are, what what you like to call it. But that's an emergency. That's a sign of a stroke to come. Um, in fact almost 20, 25% of our patients who actually come in, unfortunately, with stroke will have had a TIA in the days prior or the week prior. So don't ignore those either. Make sure you come to your emergency room as soon as possible because um, even implementing treatments after a TIA can prevent a, a stroke from actually occurring. And, and I'd like to put the pitch in for family members. Um, it, I was the river of denial, I, you know, and I'm not alone you will recognize the loss and the person you love may not recognize it. So you have to be the one in some instances to call it out and get, the, get help because the person may deny it. Even watching the weakness, they may say, oh, I'm just, I still, I'm tired. Um, so you can be in the role of a lifesaver. Great. There's so many questions. I'm trying to think how to organize them, but I think the next kind of few questions I want to talk about is that that getting help. And I know one of our um, registrants had asked, uh, you know, as they before even before the show was talking about, you know, it, living in rural Alaska, you know, how do you, you know, how do you care for patients who are hours away, you know, from from the hospital with the with the uh, appropriate level of treatment. Um, and then two, also thinking about um, in these times of COVID, people who are hesitant to go to the emergency room or, or call the ambulance. So I, I think, I know those are two separate questions, but maybe how, if you could unpack those a little bit and talk about that. Dr. Lavi? Yeah, I, I would say uh, call 911. Um, because regionally, uh, both kind of hyperlocally and beyond, the systems of care are organized so that patients are taken to the hospital that they need to go to. So the triaging system works so that, um, you know, the first responders are able to assess and, and kind of generate a short list of what uh, might be happening and take the patient to, let's say, a stroke ready facility. Um, and at least there's that first pass assessment. And then if a higher level of care is needed, um, already the, the you know, physicians on hand at that first stroke ready place can um, contact other hospitals for a transfer, whether it's um, uh, ambulance ride, a critical care transportation ride or um, airlift to another institution that can provide even yet another layer of care. So um, that's why we're really impressing upon you to not drive on your own or not be driven to the hospital by family members. That 911 call sets off a whole cascade of events that makes sure that you or your loved one are taken um, to the right hospital. There may be hospitals that are full or, and the only way, um, you would know that you were within the EMS system that was going to uh, re reroute you or take you exactly where you need to go. And so the COVID question too is, is critical. Um, we saw during the first wave of COVID something remarkable, which was that strokes uh, uh, dropped by 25% and in some municipalities, 50% in the United States. Um, COVID doesn't prevent strokes. COVID actually can increase the risk of having a stroke. So what's happening, people weren't calling for help because they feared they were going to get a COVID infection by going to the emergency department. Um, and uh, that, that data is not complete yet, but I think what, what eventually will be proven is that those patients, many of them died at home. 
uh, which is really sad. Um, our emergency rooms are incredibly well equipped now to prevent you from getting COVID by going to the emergency department. And it's probably one of the safest places on the planet, actually, because of the care and precautions that are taken. Um, we can't help you if you don't come to the hospital. We can, with telemedicine tools, help diagnose you better. And there are a number of different programs that are starting to do that. So UCSF has had an outpatient telemedicine, teleneurology program for quite some time, actually even before COVID. And um, in the heights of COVID, when our clinics were closed, many of us uh, rolled up our sleeves and used video connections for patients. And we were one of the first to really pioneer it for the medical center. And it's been really great. I mean, to think you can basically see your doctor um, open up your computer and have a visit with them and never have to pay for parking or uh, bridge toll. Holy cow. You know, I mean, that's a $30 expense there on its own. Um, so that is, I think, changed the landscape of neurology that's not urgent. But we, uh, as, as UCSF physicians, cover several of the emergency rooms in the Bay Area as neurologists, so over video. Um, and that's become a case across much of America. And it's true of many places in Europe as well, that a neurologist who there's not as many of us as there should be can dial in to an, to an emergency room remotely and see the patient on video and make decisions of acute treatment. Um, so uh, the 911 story in America is the way to go. Um, if you're in other countries like the Czech Republic was there years ago, they had their system so well organized. Everything was equidistant from each other. It was, you could get the quickest treatment. America's a little less well-designed if you're in Alaska and you're in a peripheral area and you think you're having a stroke, actually Alaska has got more airplanes per capita than anybody. So however the system is organized, um, this is one of the things we're calling to arms nationally is how do we make a system of care work for every municipality so that anyone is within a few hours or hour or less of treatment uh, that can save the brain. So that's ongoing work. Um, a lot of people are dedicated to doing it. Um, uh, but it would be helpful if you are at risk for stroke to know where your primary and comprehensive stroke centers are in your area. Um, and you can figure out which one's the closest, where to go. You can tell your family members that if you ever had a stroke, you want to go to X hospital. And that actually helps paramedics um, uh, direct a patient to a particular hospital. So all those things are helpful to think about ahead of time. Great. And I'm seeing a number of questions sort of um, risk factors related to stroke. Are there hereditary factors? Um, if you're in good health, but over 60, you know, what are, you know, risk factors or, you know, how, how much more likely are you to uh, experience a stroke? Um, and so again, a lot to unpack there and how, what's the best way to tease that out? I'd say that top five things on the list of risk factors for stroke is high blood pressure, high blood pressure, high blood pressure, high blood pressure. It is um, one of the most uh, modifiable risk factors that we have both nationally and globally. Um, and it's a risk factor for uh, many types of stroke, both ischemic and hemorrhagic. Um, so that's one, um, high cholesterol, smoking, um, diabetes, prediabetes, inactivity. So the usual cast of characters, um, both individually and uh, in aggregate, raise someone's risk uh, for stroke. And the good news is a lot of them are um, modifiable, as I mentioned, either through lifestyle changes or medications. Um, and then, of course, there's, a, there's certainly um, hereditary factors as well, but these um, risk factors are ones that, that you can sort of adjust um, with lifestyle changes. One other one is atrial fibrillation. Um, yeah. Some of you may know, uh, uh, many of you, of course, as physicians know what that is, but for those who may not know it, it's a, it's a heart rhythm disturbance that's very common um, uh, as you age. And it's a, a chaotic contraction of the heart where your heartbeat is um, irregularly irregular and you can feel it. If you touch your pulse, perhaps you test your radial pulse by feeling the pressure on the radial artery and seeing that your heart is beating like a metronome. It's nice and even, you don't have AFib. If it's irregularly irregular, so one beat happens and then it's a series of very fast beats and then it stop pauses for a moment, it may be that you have atrial fibrillation. And if you don't know that, you should, because 
uh, depending upon your age and other, um, other risk factors, having true anticoagulant medications that you take to prevent a stroke is key. It's far better than aspirin and it's far better than Plavix and it's far better than the combination of the two to take true blood thinners like Apixaban and all of the uh, 10A inhibitors or old Coumadin, other things, true blood thinners. People didn't like to take those because they're worried about hemorrhaging. And we know that you're far better off if you're taking anticoagulants in almost all cases. There's actually research that's been done at UCSF and surgeries that have been pioneered to um, treat physically the heart condition by removing part of it in a percutaneous fashion um, uh, to prevent you from having a stroke without medications. So that type of research is ongoing. There's all kinds of things we can do, but you as a patient or you as the daughter of a loved one who has a fib and says, oh, don't worry about it, it's all fine. Make sure they're on anticoagulation. And if they're not, talk to us, come talk to us. We, we can explain why it's such a big risk. So a third of all stroke over age 85 is caused by AFib. And Dr. Halabi and I can tell you stories of very in very athletic um, older men, I, I'm 60, so uh, older 70, um, uh, who are uh, big time exercisers, runners. I was a patient who was a multi-marathon winner in his age group. And he had a fib and he had a stroke from it. The guy was just totally fit. He seems like the last person who's ever gonna have a stroke. He can run three times as far as I can. But in an athletic heart syndrome where you really are an uber exerciser, you can develop atrial fibrillation. By taking an anticoagulant, you're gonna be stroke free and live forever. Uh, but if you don't, you're at risk. So AFib's bad for the brain. If you have it, make sure you've talked to a medical professional about anticoagulation. Uh, there's an interesting question here, um, going back to sort of factors for stroke is, is PTSD specifically or other mental health issues such as anxiety or depression risk factors for stroke? That is an interesting question. So um, I'll just say one comment uh, before answering it, which is um, actually depression uh, and maybe even other mood disorders are quite common after a stroke and are undertreated. Um, and when we think about managing the chronic consequences of stroke and improving someone's quality of life, um, we absolutely must screen for depression and other mood disorders. That plays into um, how someone is gonna engage with their um, therapeutic interventions, um, how someone's gonna enjoy um, their social interactions and sort of function on a day-to-day -day basis. So. I just wanted to make sure it was clear that um, if you're experiencing depression after a stroke, that is a treatable condition and it must be addressed. Um, as for these uh, uh, various types of mood disorders being risk factors for stroke, I, I think by proxy, um, you know, there may be uh, less engagement potentially with physical activity or less motivation to um, pursue um, healthy behaviors um, that take efforts and motivation. Um, and there may also be kind of um, hormonal sequelae like increased um, stress hormones like cortisol um, that can then raise blood pressure, which as I mentioned, is one of the most important risk factors for stroke that you can nip in the bud. I don't know if Dr. Smith has other thoughts. Yeah, I think the, the collection, here, what, I, what's the probability of a, a, a depression following stroke? It's 50, 60 percent? It's very high, yeah. yeah. And some of it's just situational where you feel like, you know, especially for younger individuals who have stroke, it's, you know, it's pretty stressful. I mean, it, it, some people equate it with, with mortality, as Dr. Barnes did. You know, I'm going to die from this. And so if you've never had a real threatening medical condition at age, at age 45, you have a stroke, it could be really serious. Um, but it always gets better. Um, it gets better faster with treatment. It gets better with recognizing it. And what we often teach our patients is if they feel like they're losing ground as they're recovering, really think about depression as actually the primary cause of that. That's mm -hmm. treatable. You can make your strides back. Um, we recently teamed up as the Neurocritical Care Society with uh, Same You Foundation, which uh, Dr. Halabi has worked with. With um, uh, um, help me with her name, Dr. Dr. Halabi. Uh, Amelia Clark. Yeah. So Amelia Clark, uh, the Game of Thrones actress, um, had a, a subarachnoid hemorrhage twice. 
and she talks about that publicly. And what she was, um, what she strongly feels is that there was nothing for her after she got out of the hospital. So, and maybe you can talk about this a bit more, you know, she, her complaint was, yay, we saved her from her brain aneurysm. Everything's great, you know, now go about the world. And she's trying to figure out if she can make her second season of Game of Thrones. Uh, no support. There wasn't anything that she could find. This was in the UK, but it's not dissimilar um, uh, in the United States. And I, I think your, your neuro recovery clinic is one of the few in the United States that addresses this issue. So let's talk some more about recovery and, and you know, what patients can do to be survivors and, and, and get better. Uh, Dr. Barnes, maybe you can start a little bit about how your recovery was. How long did it take? You know, when did you feel like you were back? And I see too, there's sort of a question of, you know, when you went back to work, you know, that, that pressure from the rest of the medical community you know, to take sort of your experience seriously or, you know, how, how were you able to kind of, you know, uh, not necessarily, you know, you probably couldn't hide what had happened, but was there pressure then, you know, to, to do that? Wow, that's a lot of questions. I know, that. I'm terrible at this, so I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, what I would say about recovery is my, you know, uh, I, when I left the hospital, I could walk with the aid of a cane. I had aphasia, which I didn't realize, but, um, and I could, um, the activities of daily living, I was able to feed myself. If there was food in front of me, I could mechanically put it in my, and I could ambulate, you know, with a cane, I could get around. And so I was sent home with nothing, you know, even though I was a mother of two teenage boys um, and totally unable to care for them. So um, I was ultimately able to get a lot of services, um, both through my health plan and through nonprofits, um, the College of Marin Disabled Students Program, the Schurig Center for Brain Injury Recovery, um, uh, and, and, and I ultimately got what I needed, but it took, it, it took a lot of people helping to cobble together um, uh, that for me. Um, this, the, now, getting back to work, and I'm, I'm going to jump over the recovery. When did I feel like I got back to my normal self? Never. <laughs> That's the good news. <laughs> because uh, my old me um, had tendency to depression and anxiety, and um, so Diane 2.0 is a whole lot easier person for me to live with. Um, and I, I think something zapped a part of my brain that just let me rebuild in a different way that was a much more creative and much more. Um, much better. But um, the problem of work is a real issue. Um, and um, there's a shoot the stragglers mentality in medicine. Um, we all are working too hard. We're all overloaded until you need a full another body. They don't usually get hired. So 10% of load, 20%, 30%, 40%, everybody just has to work more until it's un uh, untenable. And in that environment, someone who is um, in any way less than 100% becomes a problem. Even though I was working less, so I was paid less, there, nobody was hired to fill my spot. So the shoot the stragglers uh, uh, mentality was a problem. Um, and ultimately, um, I, I, I got back and I worked for four more years, but ultimately that was a big motivating factor behind my um, realizing, you know, if, if I'm um, giving all I have and it's still like, why doesn't she pull her load? Well, I'm only working three days a week or two and a half days a week. I can't pull a full, full term, you know, what a 40 hour, 70 hour week, whatever. It is. Um, so it's a problem in medicine. I don't know if it's better. This is, you know, my stroke was an 05. And um, so I'll, leave, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to people who are more into, um, into the sense of things now, but it was about seven years before I could find my words 
remember things, do things before I start my rehab. And at that point, I was enough involved in the acting world that I felt, you know, memorizing scripts and being doing improv and all that. I was doing all, all, many things that were continuing to help me. But the um, but I had a program of rehab that went on for seven years. I just wanted to specifically thank you. Um... Diane, for sharing your story and being so vulnerable and, and disclosing your experience. Um, I think that's pretty powerful of you to do. Um, to your comments about when you're starting to feel somewhat like your usual self or 2.0, as you say, um, I find that intriguing. Um, and uh, it sort of aligns with the concept that people can continue to recover over time. People may make the biggest gains in the first few months or year or so, but with effort um, and the right support, um, there is still the opportunity for incremental change over time. Um, so I, I tend to take a practical but, but optimistic lean when I'm having conversations like this um, and because it allows me to, again, counsel over those very modifiable risk factors and um, talk about low hanging fruit like exercise, which is known um, to not only mitigate all those risk factors that we talked about, but enhance neuroplasticity. Um, and I think the science continues to catch up for why exercise is so important for the brain and for recovery. Um, but um, the fact that even over a seven period of time, you noticed change in yourself, I think um, aligns really well with the concept that change is always possible. Sometimes it depends on where you're starting from um, and how much of a delta you have to go, but it, I would say that change is always possible. Yeah, a number of people have come to my shows and said that they were cut off by their insurance company at a year or 15 yeah. months or one month because they weren't getting better faster enough or blah, 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 blah. But there are so many nonprofits that are pulling up, they're picking up the slack um, in, on the peninsula, there's Pacific Stroke Association and, uh, you know, all around the East Bay. And I'm sure that they're around the country. Um, any number of additional resources that with um, uh, family members, um, you can get it. And I say family members because if you're impaired and you're depressed, or if you're just impaired, it's going to be very hard for the stroke patient That's right. to find what they need. And I think, you know, threading the needle between the hospital care and rehabilitation facility and or outpatient therapies um, and beyond is critical. And that's sort of one of the functions that the neuro recovery clinic um, hopes to uh, facilitate as a consultative um, entity, uh, because you're right, the insurance ends up dictating a lot of the post stroke care. Um, but we know from the science and from, you know, lots of anecdotal evidence that people can continue to evolve and change and adapt. Um, and our job uh, should be to focus on the patient and uh, try to optimize quality of life, try to prevent another stroke. Um, and uh, you're, you're right, there are community resources, but it'd be great if um, there could also be sort of a point person or point entity that could um, uh, direct patients and caregivers to these resources. I imagine you had to probably search for a lot of them on your own. Yes, but yeah. now they now have much more physiatrists who are, you know, each pay stroke patient is now given a coordinator that just wasn't the system at the time. I yeah. yeah. Well, we're getting close to the end of our hour um, and I'm so appreciative for you sharing, uh, Diane, you st sharing your performance and and us having this conversation, getting to hear uh, from Wade and, and Kathra, um, you know, with all your um, experience. So thank you so much. Dan, I'm, I'm, you know, the, you only showed us a small piece of your larger performance. Can you talk a little bit more about the, the full performance? Do you anticipate that you'll do it again? You know, that uh, our audience might be able to see, see it from beginning to end? Yes. Um, you know, and, and, you know, you do have your new show. When do you hope to debut that? Okay. Well, um, this show, um, I had a, a full schedule of performances for this year, which of course are well, all off the board. At this point, I don't anticipate making it a Zoom show. It's an 85 minute show. 
and um, there's some aspects of it that I, at the moment, I'm not anticipating uh, doing it until we can resume in the theater, but um, I definitely, it will come back um, in the theater. Um, my new show, um, Not One of Us, I, oh, I just found out I was accepted to the Playground Festival in January, of New Works, in January, uh, February this year. Playground is, a, a you know, a, 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 in San Francisco. It'll be a Zoom performance and they are limited to 45 minutes. So um, the show is likely another 80, 85 minute show and I will be doing uh, a segment there. And there's, I did a segment, an early segment um, on the Marsh. So it's on the Marsh stream on a tell it on Tuesdays. I think the date was September 29th and that's 20 minutes and it's visible online. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, that's the blessing to this pandemic is I've been able to be very creative, so. Well, wonderful. Well, I know you've gained some new fans and I also see in the Q&A, some of your old fans are also <laughs> enjoying this evening. So you're, um, you know, we really appreciate what you've shared with us. And, um, and so I just, again, thank you, Dr. Barnes and Dr. Smith, Dr. Halabi for sharing your experience, your insight and your expertise. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we'll be sure to share some additional resources with the audience in an email that will contain the event survey and the recording of tonight's event. So expect that in your in inbox in the next couple of days. Thank you to our audience of UCSF alumni, faculty, guests, and friends for joining us tonight and for all your questions. And we'll end this evening here, uh, but thank you again so much for this excellent conversation and just, you know, not only getting to talk about stroke, but also getting this cultural experience and a performance, which I feel like I haven't gotten to do in a really long time. So th thank you all so much. And I hope you have a wonderful night. Thank you all. Thank you, Katie. And thank you both. Thank you. Thank you.